Well, some of you may know, especially if you've been on Facebook, uh, that I, I actually had a birthday yesterday. So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's not really a clap-worthy birthday. It's 31. You know, last year was clap-worthy because it's a big 3-0. Right. So and it was especially clap worthy for this church because I got to tell them you no longer have a pastor in your 20s. So there you go. That was uh, yeah, that was a huge step. Um, but one of the things that is wonderful, I should say wonderfully ironic about my birthday is that it always lands right around Election Day. And so I always get the best birthday presents. Um, in fact, I was actually born on an election day, although it wasn't one of the important ones. It wasn't presidential. It was the year after George H.W. Bush was put into office. Not to date myself at all, but um, anyway. So uh, and then uh, so my birthday always kind of revolved around election day, and I never understood the importance of that as a kid. In fact, my 10th birthday, I'm not kidding you, was Bush Gore. So, yeah, I got no attention on my 10th birthday whatsoever because everyone was like, and that was when there was just one state to recount, right? That was, those were good times. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but yeah, so it, it's interesting, you know, I, and the reason I say it's wonderfully ironic is because some of you may have noticed I don't tend to get terribly political in my sermons, and yet my birthday literally revolves around normally election day, so that's fantastic. But I, I, I will say Billy Graham had the same birthday as well, so, you know, do that what you may. I just I share my birthday with some wonderful people. Anyway, um, but the, the last Sunday, I actually had the privilege of being able to go to Hosanna City Church, which meets at the Boys and Girls Club, and pray with a number of people from their church and uh, a few other churches like the, um, it's not Church of Light of Cross, but anyway, down in Morongo, um, eh, I forget the name of it. Anyway, but Pastor Monty and a few others, and so I, I knew Pastor Kyle had invited me there, but he didn't tell me what he wanted me to pray about. He just said he'd come and, and we'll just assign things for people to pray for. So we prayed for, you know, first responders. We prayed for our schools and our children. We prayed for uh, a, a lot of different things, our churches, of course. And, uh, and so I was uh, lucky enough to get the least controversial subject of the election and, uh, and got to pray for the election. And so um, I wanted to, to share with you all some of what I said a week ago because I think it's quite applicable to the situation um, because, I mean, regardless of what side of the division that you're on, no one probably batted a thousand. I, I don't think anyone probably got every single thing they were hoping for out of this election. Some people did worse. Some people did better. But uh, there, there's this thing in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, which if you, if you held your place in Luke, you could probably turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, and, and while you're turning there, I will say that the, they had a worship team that was playing songs before every one of us that would come up and pray. And so they chose a Lauren Dangle song before I came up and prayed called When You Don't Move the Mountains. And the, the chorus goes something like, when you don't move the mountains that I uh, need moved out of the way or something like that. When you don't part the waters that I have to walk through, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. So I found that rather applicable because I knew that in some way, some people, because of the election, would feel like, well, now I have a mountain in front of me, and what am I going to do? I'm not really sure how to handle this. And so the, the interesting thing about First Peter is that Peter was writing to Christian believers who were going to be enduring suffering. They were going to be going through some harsh persecution. Peter knew this. And in our terminology, what you could say is that Peter's readers were not going to have their mountains moved. They weren't going to have any seas parted before them. They were going to have to paddle their way across a rocky ocean until God eventually called them home. And he knew, Peter knew, that his readers would probably see their loved ones stripped from their hands, killed, tormented, arrested for reasons that were ridiculous. He knew that this was going to come upon them, but he also knew that this would present them with a unique opportunity because when they would be pulled aside, when they would be arrested and, and taken before others, they would be asked whether they are a Christian or not. What do you believe? Who do you profess? And so Peter gives them this call in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse 15. If you're there, just look at what he says first. And this is a foundational understanding. He says, revere in your hearts Christ as Lord. Aren't you thankful that the title, the position of Lord is not up for election? He 
says, revere in your hearts Christ as Lord. They were going to be drug out in front of authorities, in front of important people. And for them to be able to respond to what they believed, this is where Peter says it starts. Revere in your heart Christ as Lord. But then he, that's it. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But then he goes on and he tells them, be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. So this is the thing. Peter knew that his readers were going to be drug out in front of these people, and they're going to be given an opportunity. In fact, Paul gave a good example of this in the book of Acts. I forget which chapter, but at one point, Paul is being arrested. He's being dragged away, and he asked those people in authority who were currently arresting him, hey, can I say something to the crowd of people calling for my death right now? And no joke, the guy says, yeah. So he turns around, and Paul preaches a gospel message to these people who called for his death. And basically what Peter says is you're going to have that same opportunity. You're going to be arrested. So be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. Be ready. When people say, why are you a Christian? Have an answer ready. When people are wanting to harm you or look down on you because of what you believe, have an answer. But notice the two key things he says at the end of that verse that I haven't said yet. But do so with gentleness and respect. Now, I'm just going to assume I'm not the only person who struggles with gentleness and respect. Okay, good. No one raised their hands in first service. So I was the only one who has ever struggled with gentleness and respect, apparently. But this is one of the reasons why I've really distanced myself from social media. You know, a lot of people say that's that's a bad thing to do, especially in this time. Uh, you know, as a pastor, you should be more active online. Uh, but I just tell, I, I actually logged into Facebook for the first time in like two months this last week. I was going to log in on Monday and write some sort of, you know, I, I wanted it to be an inspirational, encouraging thing. And I'm not kidding you. As soon as I got logged in, there was a pit that formed in my stomach. You know, when you walk into a room and you just sense something's not right, that's the exact feeling I got. And for wrong or right, I'm just, I'm realizing that I I probably just don't have the discipline right now to be able to share Christ in those different contexts with gentleness and respect. Very, very hard to do in the context of online where there is no really personal interaction with people. But Peter tells them, you're going to be drug out in front of people. They were literally going to face people who would not only kill them, but would hurt them a whole lot along the way. And he says, you be respectful and you be gentle with them. Now, here's a question that I told them last week. If you lost every single thing that you voted for in the election, let's say every candidate, every measure, every uh, you know, a a bill or whatever that you voted for. Let's say you just struck out every single time. How would people see your hope in this world? See, I think the way that this could apply to us right now is that when people see that we, however you voted, if you lost the entire way, they would see in you a hope that is unshaken because you can give a reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and respect because it is not founded upon whoever was on your ballot this last week. Now, the reason I bring that up is because in order for us to understand what is going on at the end of Luke 9 when we, when we make our way there, we have to understand that type of mentality, that unshaken mentality of absolute trust in God's authority and in his call in our life. And so we're going to do something kind of unique. I normally don't do this. Sometimes I'll recapture, you know, recap some of the, the, the things, the events leading up to our passage. But in order for us to understand what's going on in this weird interaction that happens with Jesus and three people at the end of Luke chapter 9, I want us to see what's going on leading up to that moment. And and there's a word that we use when you're reading your Bible that helps us understand this. It's called context. 
So one of the most basic ways, if you're reading a passage you don't understand, if you're reading a verse you don't understand, one of the best places to start is context. And we have these nifty little divisions in our Bible called chapters and verses. And so maybe if you don't understand the cr- uh, what's going on in a passage, read the whole chapter and see if that helps give some clarity. So what we're going to do is we're not going to read the whole chapter of Luke 9, but we're going to walk our way through it so that when we get to the end of Luke 9, we'll kind of see some key themes Luke is bringing forward to us and his readers for us to understand. And it gives us some clarity as to what Jesus is saying uh, at, at the end of Luke 9. So you go back to the beginning of Luke chapter 9, and, and right away Jesus sends out the 12. Now these are not the post-resurrection apostles who are able to fearlessly declare under threat of death the truth of Jesus. They were still green, as we oftentimes will refer to people. They didn't have all the training that ready, but Jesus said, I'm going to give you authority to cast out demons and to heal people, and you're going to go. But here's the amazing thing. Look at verse 3. And I I said I was going to have you highlight a few things. I want you to highlight a word here. Look at verse 3. Yeah, in Luke 9. In Luke 9, verse 3, it says, He told them, take nothing for the journey. I want you to highlight that word nothing. Underline it, circle it, whatever crazy thing. Star it if you're one of the star people. Write a little note. I don't know. Whatever you need to do. Just emphasize that word nothing nothing. Jesus is going to send out his 12 apostles with nothing. He even specifies, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Literally, he sends them out with the clothes on their back, and that's it. Go and heal people. Go and do the will of God, and take nothing with you. Now, he was trying to help them understand something he's going to keep reiterating, especially in this chapter. They need to have complete reliance on God to provide. When they come back to Jesus, there is nothing they're going to be able to say that points to the greatness of themselves. I was sent out with nothing. I was empowered entirely by God to do his will. So that when they come back to Jesus, they'll recognize God is the one that provided, not me. God is the one that empowered me, not me. This is just the beginning of kind of the emphasis in Luke chapter 9 that leads us all the way through. The next thing that happens, they come back together. Jesus tries to get away with the 12, but a whole crowd of people, a huge crowd of people follow him. And so Jesus has compassion. He starts teaching them, and a story takes place that a lot of us are familiar with. He feeds 5,000 people miraculously. All the apostles are like, Jesus, it's getting late. We should send them all home. And Jesus says, no, you give them something to eat. Talk about a pit in your stomach. You know how much money that would cost Jesus? We don't have that much food. And so Jesus says, well, what do you have? And they offer what little bit they have. They have five loaves of bread and two fish, which if you were here last year when we looked at this in Mark's gospel, you might remember that the five loaves of bread is not like wonder bread. It's like pita bread. You have five slices of pita bread, and you have two fish that were maybe a little bigger than sardines. And Jesus is like, yeah, that'll work. Because once again, he feeds these 5,000 people. He has 12 basketfuls of leftover because he wants them to see it's not you that provides. It's not you that empowers. You have to learn how to be completely reliant. Even if all you have are those five loaves and the two fish, you hand them to Jesus to carry out God's will because he's the one that will empower you and strengthen you from this. And so this situation leads to Peter then in the the next section, starting in verse 18 to Uh, declare Jesus as the Messiah, which means they now understand Jesus is something more than just a prophet. He's not just a a gifted teacher. There's something big happening here. You are the one God has been prophesying about for almost all eternity. This is it. You're him. So you would think that with that type of introduction, they recognize the importance of Jesus, that Jesus would not do what he does next. When you're introduced as an important person, you don't come out and you say a bad thing about yourself. And yet, what does Jesus do? He shows the weakness he's about to endure. You are the Messiah. Jesus is great. Guess what? We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be rejected by all the most looked up to authorities by the teachers of the law, by the Pharisees, by the scribes, all of them will reject me. I'll be tortured. 
and then I'll be killed. Three days later, I'll rise up. Now, what's amazing is that Jesus kind of lays this out for them, what he's going to do, but they, they don't get it yet. They don't understand what Jesus is talking about. But then notice what Jesus says next, because this is very familiar to us. In verse 23, he says, then he said this to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. I want you to underline daily. Luke is the only one that records that word daily here. I want you to deny yourself. Take a, If you want to be a, a follower of Jesus, here's his outline for it. You get rid of yourself. You deny yourself. If you're denying yourself, what does that mean? That you are now entirely dependent upon God. You take up your cross. You die to yourself. So, uh, oftentimes when we read this, this passage, we get inside of our minds and we think, you know what, if I were ever faced with a life and death situation, if someone had a gun to my head, I would say, yes, I believe in Jesus and I would die for Jesus. And I think that's why Luke includes daily. Because the point isn't just that we would be willing to die in a hypothetical situation, but whether you're willing to die now, every single day, giving up of yourself, for the will of God. That type of sacrifice is very common in Luke's gospel. He, he, he really encompasses the cost of discipleship over and over again. And, and that type of, of giving up of yourself, of self-sacrifice, is really what Jesus gets at at the end of the chapter. But continuing on from here, Jesus says in verse 27, a kind of enigmatic statement that some people who are here will not die before they see the kingdom of God which might confuse a lot of people, but it's interesting. All three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, immediately follow that saying with the transfiguration, which happens next. And if you don't know, transfiguration, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. They go up on a mountain, and Jesus is transfigured. He's transformed. He's, he's changed in appearance. He almost looks like an angel. He's glowing. And, and then Moses and Elijah come by, and, and they start talking. Now, Luke is the only Gospel that tells us what they talk about. And it fits in very well with, with Luke's theme here, as we'll, we'll see, and really a theme throughout his gospel. But notice in verse 31, it says this is what they spoke about. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Now, underline the word departure, however it's translated in your, uh, your translation, and also Jerusalem. Now, the word departure there, um, my, my NIV even has a footnote there. It's the word exodus, right? Think about what the exodus was for Israel. Freedom from slavery by the power of God. So Jesus was going to go to Jerusalem and fulfill his departure, which really was kind of a picture. It, it, he was kind of painting this idea. Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem and have a exodus of some sort, which now we understand is his death and resurrection and then his ascension that completely frees us from sin but then this was all going to take place in jerusalem jerusalem is a big key part of luke's gospel and even the book of acts which luke also wrote in fact some people will say that the whole gospel of luke is the story of everything pointing to what happens in jerusalem and then the book of acts is everything kind of going out from jerusalem the gospel spreading out from there in the beginning of Acts, Jesus says in 1.8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So it's a spreading out of the gospel. But in Luke's gospel, everything is kind of pointing to what Jesus will accomplish in Jerusalem. And so when Jesus is speaking to Moses and Elijah in this rather amazing situation, they're talking about what he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem. Then before they finish up, a cloud comes down and God speaks. Now just imagine for a moment, Peter, James, and John hear God speak. That's kind of an overwhelming situation to be a part of. And they're like terrified because a cloud comes down. If you're in the presence of God so much so that he is literally audibly speaking loudly, that's a terrifying position to be in. Especially when you consider, if you remember the first time Peter realized who Jesus was, what did he say? Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Now he's in the presence of God, 
fully glorified in heaven. So yeah, they're a little scared. In fact, they don't say anything about this to anyone until after Jesus resurrects, and then they're like, oh, okay, I think I understand this a little more of what was going on here. But notice when God speaks in verse 35, what God says, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Not listen to your heart. Listen to yourselves. Just, you know, focus inside. Your, your gut will guide you, man. Right? <laughs> listen to him. Reliance. Again, on God, on Jesus. Right after this, we see a situation that we see often in the Gospels. It, it's, uh, I mean, it's remarkable, but it's, it's common. We see it happen all the time. Jesus heals someone. In this case, it's a demon-possessed boy. But what's interesting is that this is a weird situation because the apostles were originally asked to heal this boy, and they couldn't. We're not really told why. Uh, in, the, in, I think, Matthew's gospel, Jesus clarifies for them when they said, we don't, we don't know why it didn't come out. And Jesus says, this one can only come out through prayer. And, and, and so we, we don't really, we're not really told what happened here, but I think what may have happened is that in, in both situations, when this is recorded for us, Jesus' immediate response to finding out his apostles were not able to drive out this demon was saying, you faithless, you unbelieving generation. I think that unbelief is the key. I think what may have happened is that this demon was especially violent. It would throw this boy into convulsions and foam at the mouth, and perhaps they were so caught up in the physical, they forgot to rely on God to do the actual work of casting out this demon. They didn't believe, which happened quite often. So my guess is, I can't back this up fully, but my guess is they struggled with unbelief, and that's why Jesus is like, really? You literally just did this over and over again. This is no different. Believe in God. It's him that's going to cast out this demon. But then also notice in verse 43 what they were amazed at. After this boy is healed and, and he's, he's all good, it says in verse 43, they were amazed at the greatness of God. See, that's the thing about miracles is that they should not draw us to the people whom they were performed out of. True miracles draw us closer to God, not the people who happen to be around who God chooses to work through. That's one of the big differences. If you go on YouTube, you could type in faith healers, and you see all sorts of different people, and they're constantly drawing glory to themselves. Oh, thank you. You did it. Oh, what? No, no even when Jesus healed this boy, they were drawn to God. Right after this, Jesus once again predicts his death, and they don't get it. I'm going to be taken. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be killed twice now. Jesus has emphasized this. And they didn't understand what was going on here, what was happening. But something happens right after Jesus predicts his death that Mark's gospel has happening every time. The three times Jesus predicts his death, Mark records this happening every time. An argument broke out in verse 46. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Can you imagine the audacity? I mean, obviously, we understand they didn't get it. They didn't understand fully what Jesus was saying here. They thought, you know, maybe he was speaking metaphorically, or maybe they didn't think about it at all. But Jesus just lays out, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be resurrected. That's amazing. That's awesome and horrifying all at the same time. And they're like, hey, who's the bet? I think I am. Yeah, it's definitely me. I'm going to be the greatest. And so Jesus takes this opportunity. And in one of the greatest examples of, remember we said gentleness and respect? Jesus showcases that for us here. Because I think any one of us would have probably just popped them in their faces. And Jesus instead takes a kid and he sets the kid before them. And he's like, you want to be the greatest? Receive the kingdom of God like a child. 
We talked about that a month or so ago, right? And, and there's a lot of different ideas that can back into receiving the kingdom of God like a child. But in the context of Luke chapter 9, utter reliance on God. You want to be the greatest? Learn how to rely on God more than anything else. Like a child. Have that type of humility. Stop trusting in yourself and what you're able to do. Then in verse 51, we see a shift in Luke's gospel. And I actually, I didn't know about this shift until I started school this last semester. I didn't realize that right here, there's a break, there's a shift in, in Luke's gospel where now there's a focal point like we talked about in Jerusalem. And look at what it says in verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, Jesus knew full well what was awaiting him in Jerusalem. He knew what would happen there, and yet he set out resolutely. Nothing was going to get in his way. He was going to go and accomplish the will of the Father at Jerusalem. And so in verse 51, in the, in the Gospel of Luke, there's a shift. Now, Jerusalem is brought up over and over again. It, it keeps saying, as Jesus made his way to Jerusalem. So there's a focal point. We know what's going to happen at the end, and Jesus set out for that. And then in one of the greatest examples for us of a complete contrary teaching to what you've often heard from the, you know, the pastors who will say that, you know, if you trust Jesus, your relationships, your health, everything will get better. In complete contrast to that, Jesus sets out to accomplish God's will and immediately is rejected. He goes to a Samaritan village, which if you're here a couple of weeks ago, we saw that went quite well the first time. He talked with the woman at the well. She went back. They asked him. They begged him to stay for two more days, and he taught, and it went really well. This time he goes to a Samaritan village. They find out he's going to Jerusalem where the Jews gather, and they say, go away. Just because you are doing the will of God does not guarantee things are going to go well for you. Jesus Right after it says he is set out to go and accomplish the will of God resolutely towards Jerusalem, he is rejected and asked to leave. And it's in that context that he left, and then Luke records these three kind of weird conversations with Jesus. Now I'm going to just read it all. And then we'll look at all three of these guys real quick and try and understand what Luke is saying to us, what we're supposed to learn from this. But in verse 57, it says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But that man replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. And Jesus replied to him, saying, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now reading that, can you understand how there might be some confusion here? This doesn't look like Jesus. What happened to the fishers of men thing? When he called the apostles, he made it, you know, hey, hey, come with me, and I'll make you fishers of men. But there's one little aspect about that, you know, maybe more flowery memory of Jesus. What did the apostles do? They left behind everything. They even say that in John 6, when a whole swell of people leave Jesus after his hard teaching, Peter says, we've already left everything for you. That's why these conversations seem kind of weird to us. Because I think Jesus is driving home this point we've seen over and over again. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, there's got to be an utter reliance upon God. Just complete giving of yourself to him. So let's go ahead and look at this first guy who comes to Jesus and says, I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus. I'll, I'll follow you. Now, some people have said this guy was being presumptuous in like a bad way. He was coming along. He's like, hey, I'll be one of your 12. 
but I don't really get that from what it says here because Jesus doesn't reject him. Jesus just gives this basic answer. Foxes have dens, birds have nests. I don't even have a pillow. In essence, what Jesus is saying is, you just declared to me, you will follow me wherever I go. You realize that means I don't even have a home? I don't have a bed. Foxes have beds. Birds have beds. I don't have a bed. I think what Jesus is doing right here is what he does in a few chapters later in Luke 14 when Jesus tells them to count the cost. You want to follow me? Count the cost. And Jesus, maybe, remember last week or two weeks ago, we saw in John chapter 2, it said that, jo- that Jesus knew what was inside of every man. I wonder if he knew what was inside this guy. He's like, maybe this is going to be troubling for him to hear. He needs to hear this, though. You follow me wherever I go, that means you may not have a house. You may lose everything. Jesus is kind of making sure he understands that. We don't know how this guy responded. It's not recorded to us. But Jesus doesn't reject him. He just lays it out for him. Could mean giving up everything. The second guy comes up, and this time Jesus calls him. Out of the three, this is the only one Jesus calls first. And he says, follow me. It's the same word he used for the disciples. Same word he uses for all the other people he's called. Follow me. Even the rich young ruler, Jesus said, follow me. And in this case, once again, we don't know how this guy responds to what Jesus says. But initially he says, okay, yeah, I, I'll follow you, but let me go bury my father. Now, sometimes I've heard this taught to, to kind of soften Jesus' seemingly harsh words next as, as this guy's father wasn't actually dead. Really what he was doing is asking for an indefinite leave of absence until his father dies and he can bury him. Then he can go and follow Jesus. And that's very possible, but it doesn't say that explicitly this guy's father may have been cold and dead it seems weird that he would be here instead of with his family but still let's say the dad is dead and the guy's like let me go take care of him first then i'll follow you so why would jesus say hey let the dead bury their own dead you go and proclaim the gospel the kingdom of god that seems like a really harsh thing to say right i I don't know any of us that would be like yeah no no, nope, forget that. But what Jesus is doing here is upending their understanding of importance. Y- you don't have to know biblical history to understand that in the Middle Eastern culture, family is everything. Family takes precedence over everything else, and especially so in first century Judaism where this is taking place. To bury your father and mother took precedence over everything. There wasn't a single, you wouldn't even eat yourself. You would bypass all the other laws that you were to be required to follow to bury your parent. That meant number one, right? We talked about priorities last week. That was number one. Your father or mother died. You make it your number one priority to give them a proper burial. And what Jesus is doing is shifting things up for them. Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. This sounds harsh, but there's literally nothing more important for followers of Jesus than to proclaim the kingdom of God. Nothing. It takes precedence over even our most strongly held family requirements. Oftentimes when we talk about the cost of discipleship, we think about maybe material possessions we might lose, maybe a few relationships that will flounder out or end badly. But it also means that certain things in your life need to change. Your calling to bring this word into this world is more important than anything else. That's what Jesus was saying to this guy. And he wanted him to understand, go and proclaim the gospel. Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, this third guy, Luke, is the only one to record it, and I think it's to help us understand the emphasis of the second guy. And here's what I mean. This guy comes to Jesus, and look at what he says. 
I will follow you, Lord, but first. Now let me ask you this. If Jesus were to come here physically and go up to one of you, just straight up and just say, hey, I want you to follow me. Is there anything that would be more important than that? That's the thing. This guy come, came to Jesus and said, I will follow you, Lord, but first, does it really matter what the reason is? I'm not saying this is easy teaching. I'm not saying all of you are going to be like, yeah, no, I love this. I love hearing about the cost of disciples. Just give me more, right? Let me hear. See, the thing is, even as I'm, I was putting this message together and looking at how <laughs> constantly Luke is talking about our utter reliance upon God and, and driving that home throughout the gospel of Luke, and especially in this chapter, it, it's hard teaching. But Jesus wanted him to understand when he said in verse 62, no one puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. One commenter basically said that what Jesus is saying here is that anyone who constantly wants to look back while they're being called forward isn't going to fit into God's kingdom very well. I think God is calling our church to continually step forward. And maybe you're not at this point, but eventually that means we're going to be led to a place that's uncomfortable. We're going to be led to a place where we're going to make decisions that are not popular. You might lose family members and friends in that type of relationship because of these decisions. Do you trust in God, even if you're faced with that? See, the thing is, right after this, I, I don't want to go all the way through the whole Gospel of Luke, but right after this, Jesus sends out 70 unnamed people, 72, 70. He sends out all these people who we don't even know who they are, but he gives them the same authority as the 12, and he says, go. And then Jesus, I, I love this. If you look at verse 3 of chapter 10, look at the picture. It's a very comforting picture, says. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs before wolves. Uh, anyone feel like that? Every time I talk about discipleship and how we should be discipling and, and reaching our world with the gospel, you ever feel like a lamb among wolves? Yeah, that's a pretty nice picture. Let me ask you this. How would a lamb survive among wolves? Because a lot of us are pessimistic, and we're like, why would Jesus send out his lambs to the slaughter? Why would he send them out among wolves to die and be eaten up? Because that's what we feel like when we fail. Every time we try to share the gospel and we fail, we feel like Jesus sent me out a lamb to be eaten by a wolf. How would lambs survive being among wolves? Anyone want to take a guess? We can make this kind of a call answer thing. God, okay, Jesus, basically, a lamb would have to be by its shepherd. It seems simplistic, but what have we been talking about the entire way through Luke chapter 9? Complete reliance on God to carry it on. We are like lambs being sent out into wolves, and the only way we will survive is by being near the shepherd, by trusting in him, by believing in his power that he has given us to reach the world. It's not by your skill and your ability. It's by him working in and through us. That's what these three little weird interactions are about. You have to be willing to give up everything. A lot of people right now feel like they don't know what they're going to be giving up over the next four years, depending on how things pan out one way or another. And I know this seems harsh, but let me just say that the work of the church is not affected by whoever is in the White House. Because going back to 1 Peter 3, who is our Lord? in the kingdom that we properly belong to as we journey through this life. Who are you relying on 
in regards to your hope. There's a one last weird little thing. I know I'm running long today, but I never run long, so you're welcome. But uh, if you go down a little bit more in Luke chapter 10, see, there's an excitement, I think, that comes when we follow Jesus, when we give ourselves completely to him and his will. He will work through us to do things we wouldn't expect him to. He will reach people we wouldn't expect him to be able to reach. He will do things through you that are exciting and awesome to carry out his will. And that's what happened with the 70. He sent them out, and they came back to Jesus. And if you skip down to verse 17, you can just hear the excitement in their voices. Look at them. It says, the 70, 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Oh, that's awesome. Can you imagine? You now have the power to be an exorcist. Let's go. Right? That's awesome. Let me go out. Yeah, I'm going to do all this. This is so cool. They even answer to your name, Jesus. This is working through me. Look at how Jesus responds. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the powers of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Why? Because I gave you that power. (laughs) And then look at the humbling thing he says in verse 20. Don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You want to know the key to being able to share the reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and respect to anyone that asks you? It's that. There is no pride in the kingdom of God because everything is by his power. They come back, and they're all excited. Jesus, I casted out a demon. You know how cool that is? And Jesus is like, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. You think casting out a demon is cool? I gave you that authority. Don't rejoice. In those things, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I don't know what is going to happen in our country over the next four years, over the next two months for that matter. But what I'm controversially saying to you is that it doesn't matter. We serve in a kingdom where there are no elections. We serve in a kingdom who has called us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, to love our neighbor as Jesus has loved us. He says, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. How did they get there? Because you're so great? Because Jesus accomplished what we could not. Jesus did what we could not. He makes us what we are not now. So that when we go... Before him in heaven, we stand perfect, pure, righteous, and sinless. Rejoice in that. Trust in God to do the awesome work that he's called you to do. Every week we end with three songs, and we invite you to come and and take of communion and remember what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Next week I'm excited because we're going to look at the truth of how we are connected to that work of Jesus on the cross in an amazingly powerful way that I think we oftentimes don't realize. But as we sing these songs, I want you to remember what Jesus accomplished, how he washes you white as snow, how he, he paid for your sins. He bore them for you. He accomplished perfection, and now he passes that on to you. Now go and tell the world that that offer is available to all of them. Go and not only tell them how much the Lord loves them, show them. When you're talking with someone who is super excited about how things turned out this last week, show them gentleness and respect that can only come empowered by the God that you serve.
show them a love that goes beyond what they've seen in any other religion, in any other background, because it's empowered supernaturally beyond your ability. Trust in God more than anything. May that be the central part of our life, to completely trust in Him. Let's praise God now.